Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation. Extracellular vesicle-mediated mRNA-based gene delivery for targeted treatment of HER2-positive breast cancer in mice by ProDrugs, a new gene-delivered de enzyme ProDrug therapy. Presented by Dr. A.C. Mann, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Stanford University School of Medicine. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Matten. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, to the audience, uh, you just heard the uh, topic of my presentation, so I wouldn't uh, repeat it. Uh, this is a uh, collaborative uh, effort uh, that has uh, uh, engaged uh, several members of my own group whose names uh, appear under my name, A.C. Manson. <clears throat> and it also includes several Stanford scientists, so for example, Dr. Pilgrim and others that are uh, mentioned in, on this slide, as well as extra uh, Stanford people, uh, Stanford Research Institute, and Exoterra, uh, Dr. Uh, Elaine Delcare has been involved and a local company, Systems Biosciences. And also, uh, in the course of this uh, research, we received uh, quite a bit of feedback from uh, uh, NIH intramural scientists, and their names are listed right there, Drs. Table, Who, Rodriguez, and Waldes. So first, uh, background on pro-drugs that have been used uh, for treating cancer. Prodrugs um, are compounds that are harmless in their native state, but they can become, they do become highly toxic when activated by a bacterial or a viral enzyme. So then, you know, if you could confine the capability to generate that enzyme to the tumor, then you have a situation where <clears throat> you can have uh, off-site free uh, therapy, only that the tumor would be uh, harmed when the pro-drug is administered because it's, it's only the tumor that can activate it. And that, you know, if done properly, would overcome the uh, serious issue of uh, most of the conventional therapeutic approaches, which we all know not only uh, uh, kill the cancer cells, but cause a great deal of uh, off-site uh, toxicity, which is highly uncomfortable and terrible. So um, the, the two GDEPs have been uh, tested in uh, clinical trials, and I'll give you a brief uh, introduction, a brief description of them. So one of them is uh, called Gensi Clover, <clears throat> and this, uh, uh, is activated by a viral enzyme, thymidine kinase 1, which converts it into a compound. You can see the arrow uh, from gensiclovir leading to the compound that the uh, viral enzyme converts, upon which uh, that compound is, is, is acted upon by uh, the host uh, uh, kinases and converts the, uh, the compound into an analog of uh, guanosine triphosphate. And this analog can then get into the uh, DNA, uh, break apart the DNA, destroy it, and kill the cell. 
So, as I said, if you could confine it, if you could, could confine this capability to the tumor, that would be great. All right, so this um, is the only uh, pro-drug uh, therapeutic regimen that has been subjected to a phase three clinical trial. Um, and this was done for glioblastoma multiform patients, 248 of them were involved. The gene encoding this end is activating enzyme, this viral enzyme was introduced uh, using a virus and directly into the cranium. Uh, you know, none of the pro-drug approaches have as yet until our own work, which I'll describe uh, shortly, have attempted to systemically target the gene. They have, in all cases, the gene was delivered directly to the cancer itself. Okay, so this uh, clinical trial was conducted and uh, the result was that no benefits uh, were seen whatsoever. Another uh, pro-drug <clears throat> called CB1954 or tretazecar uh, has been subjected to uh, phase one, two clinical trials. It is activated by uh, a bacterial enzyme called NTR. And, uh, you know, the NTR converts it into two compounds, which you can see uh, from the arrows. And one of these compounds, the top one, is then acted upon by one of our metabolites, which are found in, in all human beings, and gets converted, again, into a highly toxic uh, benzamide. And this uh, also has the effect of mucking up the DNA and kill the cell. So as I said, it has been subjected to phase one, two uh, clinical trials. Uh, and the results were really quite equivocal. In some cases, uh, there seemed to be little benefit in the sense that the PSA concentration didn't go up as high as in, in non-treated patients and such. But uh, it really wasn't regarded as, as, a, as an encouraging result. And so the uh, uh, trial did not proceed to the phase three stage. So what were the reasons for these failures? <clears throat> A most important reason is that the, the, the amount of gene delivered to the target was insufficient. It's a small amount of the gene, the nucleic acid encoding the gene. And the expression of the uh, gene within the uh, target uh, tissue was of a short duration. So this is a major uh, weakness of, the, of this approach. This is, this is found. Then uh, the enzyme uh, that the gene encoded, that the genes encoded, lacked sufficient potency. And then, you know, as I mentioned, viruses were used that have their own problems. Some of them are listed there, inflammation and uh, uh, antigenic, uh, the uh, immune uh, rejection. <clears throat> and another uh, very important factor was insufficient uh, attention to the bystander effect. So what is the bystander effect? Okay. When you try to uh, uh, deliver a gene to cancer or to anywhere, anywhere else, None of the existing methods can convert all the target cells, can transfect all the target cells with their gene. Only if, you know, a certain proportion gets uh, uh, transfected. So to be able to kill all the tumor cells, what you need is that the cells that do get transfected generate enough of the drug, have capability of of converting the, enough of the product into the drug, number one. And number two, that this drug should be able to diffuse out of those cells so as to be able to kill the neighboring cells that have not been transfected. So uh, to begin with, uh, the Jensi Clover has a very poor uh, bystander effect. But uh, and that was one of the reasons of the, for, for the failure. 
CB1954 tretazecon has uh, a very good bystander effect. But you know, in order to properly uh, carry out these kinds of uh, uh, treatments, it is necessary to know what is the least uh, number of cells that need to be transfected uh, to, to bring about killing of the entire tumor. But no attention was paid to this quantitative aspect of what is the degree of transfection that is necessary. So we have paid attention to uh, these factors and uh, I will now describe our own uh, research. So we, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we, have we have discovered a new uh, prodrug and a new activating bacterial enzyme. The prodrug is called CNOM. Its uh, full chemical name is complicated and I won't go into it. The references uh, uh, on this slide can take you on the, the, to the papers where the full name is given. The enzyme is CHRR. And what uh, the enzyme does is to convert CNOG, which is harmless, it's a prodrug, into the highly toxic drug called NCHB. And you can see that. You can see the arrows leading from you know, uh, CNOG to NCHB. And having examined the, the mode of action <clears throat> of uh, NCHB, we know that it kills cells by apoptosis uh, induced through the mitochondrial pathway. And how do we know it? Well, uh, it's given on the slide. I'll briefly mention a few. It arrests the uh, nuclear development in the S phase. Phosphated in serine it is, is exposed on the surface of the membrane. S phase three is induced. It co-localizes with mitochondria and depolarizes the uh, membrane potential of mitochondria. So apoptosis is great because this means that uh, this drug can kill both growing and non-growing cells. And that's really important because in a solid tumor, at any given time, you have a significant number of cells that are not growing. And, uh, you know, not to be able to kill them is problematic for any uh, therapy. Another um, important feature of uh, NCHB is that it is highly fluorescent. And the center bar on the uh, graph to your right, at least to my right, um, shows you the high degree of fluorescence. It is at 620 uh, nanometers, which means that you can visualize it non-invasively in living mice. So this aspect, the, the fluorescence of uh, MCHB has been very helpful in our ability to further develop this, uh, this therapeutic uh, regimen, because you know to be able to see something is much easier than to do complicated chemical analyses like HPLC and, and things like that, which have been necessary to uh, characterize many other drugs, including all the prodrugs that I, both of the prodrugs that I, that I just uh, mentioned. So here is one example. Um, all the magenta color that you're seeing is MCHD fluorescence. And what we did here was to, uh, you know, in a monolayer, we uh, infected a few of the cells with the gene, and the gene was carried by, by a bacterium. Um, and then we found that even though only a few cells had the genetic capability of converting CNOV into MCHP, the magenta color spread out throughout the monolayer. And then below that, you see a, a three-dimensional structure. It's called a spheroid, which is more realistic in terms of a, of a tumor. And here we added something like one to a hundred uh, trans transfected cells. And again, we saw that the magenta color is spread uh, all over. So clearly, MCHB has, a, has an excellent uh, bystander effect. And we could visualize it quite easily as a result of its uh, fluorescence. 
even more important, but I mean equally important, um, as I mentioned to you, it can be visualized in living mice. So we, we stuck to, you know, in these initial studies, we stuck to the method that had been used before, which is uh, direct uh, injection or expression of the gene by the cancer cells. <clears throat> and you can see, if you look at the top panel of the graph on my right, um, where the mice uh, can be seen, um, the blue is the tumor. And this tumor is expressing the enzyme CHRR. And you can see that the magenta color, if you look at the uh, third uh, uh, mouse uh, to, to the left uh, of this uh, top panel, that the magenta color is confined to the tumor. Now, if you go to the lower part of this uh, slide, uh, the lower three mice, this is a situation where the gene expression was not confined to the tumor. It was expressed randomly. And you can see that the magenta color is uh, can be seen elsewhere uh, as well. So you see, this kind of thing enables you, just by observation, to be able to tell how successful an approach is the approach that you are taking in confining the activation of the prodrug to the tumor, how, you know, whether off-site uh, activation is taking place or not. And then on the extreme right uh, is a, you know, is a um, is demonstration that uh, the uh, fluorescence of MCHP quantitatively reflects it, the, the, uh, it's quantitatively quantified <laughs> by, uh, by its fluorescence. And so that's, that's an added advantage, and it can be done down to a very low uh, level, something like two nanograms per, per, per uh, gram of, uh, of tumor. Okay, so um, if, you, if you take a look uh, to the left top, uh, Graph. Here again, we have used the, uh, the same approach that had been used in, in the previous uh, uh, pro-drug regimens, that is uh, a direct injection of the, of the gene into the tumor. And uh, so uh, these are mice, you know, which have uh, tumors in them. And you can see, if you look at the, <clears throat> at the curve, to the very left, that when CNOP is not administered, and we administered CNOP intravenously, when it is not administered, the, the mice die, all of them die by the age of, by the uh, by day 24 or some such thing. But with uh, uh, CNOP at 10 milligram per kilogram, you still have 40% survival at the on day 140 or, or so. So it's a highly effective. Uh, uh, therapy. And the rest of it is to, uh, you know, uh, characterize what is called phosphokinetics and phosphodynamic. This is important because you need to know how long the uh, pro-drug and the drug stay in the serum and in the tumor, what kind of concentration they uh, attain. You know, the thing is that if the drug stays in the, uh, in the serum or in the plasma, for too long, then uh, it can affect other uh, organs as well. You know, after all, the, the uh, drug is being generated in the tumor, but there is blood circulation. It is going to leak out and, and get into the uh, into the serum or into the uh, plasma. And if it stays there for too long, it can hurt uh, other organs. But we found that these things are very favorable for this uh, regimen. There is quick uh, uh, excretion. Of the uh, of the drug, and then we also using this the, these data uh, used a special uh, software to predict um, you know whether we needed to improve you know to increase the uh, dosage uh, much for effectiveness, and the answer is no. Okay, so next is the enzyme I just described to you how the pro drug. This enzyme we as I said we discovered originally it is called CHRR. And as I mentioned already, one of the uh, factors that uh, were limiting 
for the success of the uh, clinical trials was the low potency of the activating enzyme. So we decided that we need, needed to improve the uh, strength, the potency of this enzyme. And for this, <clears throat> we used uh, all of the uh, cutting-edge uh, technologies. Number one is directed uh, evolution. And what you do in directed evolution is you <coughs> chop up the gene in uh, you know, several fragments, and you let them combine at random. And if you do this with a large enough number of fragments, almost certainly you would, well, certainly, you, you would reconstitute the gene in a way that it would encode a protein which, is, which has a better fit for carrying out the reaction that you have, that you're interested in. So you can do it by uh, what is called DNA shuffling or by error-prone PCR. And as you see, we have a good uh, screening system for the fluorescence. And so we were able to, uh, uh, you know, examine something like six to seven thousand uh, gene permutations, and found and and detect those that were that that encoded the more potent enzyme, and we achieved a two thirty fold improvement by this uh, by this approach. The second one, and I won't go too much into its detail. It utilized a uh, statistical model that was developed at uh, Stanford Business School. And it's really an algorithm, and it can, when you uh, apply the algorithm, it can predict uh, what change, what the specific amino acid change would lead to improvement. And then in a second round, you can have further, further uh, uh, replacements. And uh, so we did that and really enhanced the uh, activity uh, further uh, very considerably. And finally, um, you know, the, the eight-old method is X-ray crystallography. And uh, so we did that. We crystallized uh, CHRR. It is a tetramer uh, with a 22 kDa molecular weight. And in this tetramer, the, uh, the dimers interact. Uh, with each other, and the amino acids involved in that interaction are uh, mentioned below, are, are uh, listed below the, uh, the blue uh, um, high, highlighted, the blue margin uh, uh, square that you see on the slide. And they are tyrosine 128, uh, glutamate 146, tyrosine 85, and arginine 122. Okay, so the fact that tyrosine 128 was involved really immediately uh, caught our attention because we had discovered uh, as a result of the directed evolution that tyrosine 128 conversion into uh, asparagine had a marked effect on the improvement of the enzyme. And so we began to reason as to why that may be the case. And if you look at, uh, it's, I can't point out the, uh, uh, you know, the mouse is, cannot be seen by you, but if you look at Y128 on the dimer to your, uh, to your left, you can see that on its oxygen atom, which is red, three or four uh, uh, bonds converge. But if you alter, if you change this uh, uh, tyrosine to, to uh, um, to the amino acid I just mentioned, to asparagine. Then what happens is that these uh, uh, bonds get, you know, uh, joined to different uh, groups, and the result is strengthening of the dimer-dimer interaction. Not only that, we also, uh, you know, by chemical reasoning, were able to determine that this change would enlarge the active site <coughs> of the enzyme. The active site contains a flavin mononucleotide. So having discovered this, we said, okay, suppose we change 
all the other, you know, the rest of the three amino acids that are involved in this time and time interaction in the same way, so that will further improve the enzyme activity. <clears throat> and as you can see, we changed GLU146 to threonine. You can see the red uh, font there. Tyrosine 85 to asparagine, arginine 125 to methionine, and all of them uh, further improve the activity of the enzyme. So we ended up with an enzyme which is hundredfold, which has hundredfold greater potency than is the case with the currently available improved uh, NTR enzyme, which I showed to you uh, earlier, was used in a clinical trial with CD1954. Okay, so this is how we improved the, uh, the enzyme. And then we decided, you know, we had to decide which uh, answer to uh, address. And we chose, at least for our initial studies, HER2 positive breast cancer, which is caused by the amplification of the HER2 gene, resulting in a very high level of expression of the HER2 receptor by the, uh, by the tumor. And, you know, the, it's something like 100-fold increase. And this is so great that if, if you could use this uh, uh, the HER2 as a target for introducing, for targeting a, uh, a drug, you can really attain uh, quite a high degree of selective uh, specific uh, treatment. And based on this uh, principle, uh, uh, the uh, monoclonal uh, 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 antibodies were developed, you know, I think initially by Genentech. And uh, for example, trastuzumab, which is one of these uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies, uh, turned out to be quite effective in uh, enhancing the uh, prognosis and survival of patients uh, with this uh, HER2 positive, uh, with this uh, type of cancer. Okay, that's great. But, you know, side effects uh, persist, which are not pleasant. Nevertheless, you know, it, it has been a great advance. However, recent work has shown, you know, these are uh, uh, clinical studies in which something like 12,000 patients were, were followed for a period of 10 years. Uh, these were patients who had been treated with trastuzumab and were cured by trastuzumab. But in this, uh, uh, in this study, this 10-year uh, uh, follow-up study, it, it, it was found that something like 25% of these uh, suffer from relapses. And these relapses are metastatic and not responsive to transducement. So all of this indicates uh, the need for radically new therapies, so we decided to, uh, to choose this. Okay, so as I said, in all the other uh, road drug approaches, the gene was, had to be put directly into the cancer that, you know, can not be very effective. You, it, its uh, application can be highly limited. Not all cancers are approachable. You, you, don't, you can't see them. You can't really directly put an enzyme or whatever uh, directly into the cancer. And certainly, as far as metastasis is concerned, that, that uh, thing is not going to work uh, at all. <clears throat> so it is absolutely essential for uh, real effectiveness of GDEC to be, to, to be able to have a method which permits the targeting of the cancer on systemic delivery of the agent that is carrying the gene that we are interested in. Okay, so as I mentioned in the context of the trials, <clears throat> the vehicle that was used for viruses and those have really serious problems. Um, 
although some you know some therapies are, have been approved by FDA using viruses, but they you know they can get activated and they are immune uh, rejection, inflammation, and things like that. So we decided to bypass these uh, conventional uh, ways of uh, delivering the gene. Instead, we used extracellular vesicles, which is part of my uh, the title of my talk. So what are these extracellular vesicles? Well, the thing is that nearly all of our uh, body cells uh, give out small uh, bilipid, bilayer lipid entities, and these are called exosomes. <clears throat> they carry with them selected contents of the uh, of the uh, producer cell, the, the cell that is producing uh, the EVs, and they go and deliver these contents to other cells in the end, becoming clearer and clearer that this intracellular communication is very important for the health of the body. And this, this also shows that EVs are nature's antigen delivery system. And if so, they are likely to be, they are less likely to have deleterious immune responses, especially if you use EVs derived from the cells of the patient himself or herself. The surface properties of these EVs are such, you know, protein like this Tetris fan and CD9, that they can uh, fuse with the membrane of the recipient cell and empty their content directly into the cytosol of the uh, of the recipient cell. And so you can have very quick uh, uh, expression of whatever you are uh, trying to deliver, a rapid effect. And, you know, they're small, something like 100 uh, nanometers, and so avoid uh, uh, being eaten away or removed by phagocytes. Uh, they can avoid lysosome and endosome pathway. So as a result, because of what likely when viruses and, and other uh, delivery agents to reach, and if they are properly targeted, to reach the uh, intended uh, des destination upon systemic delivery. Okay. Also, this is how we made our EVs, and some examples of EVs are uh, shown in here. We used uh, HEC293 cells. These are the workhorse of, uh, of uh, biological search. Uh, and what you know, what you do, you you grow the cells uh, in a regular way, and while growing, they give out these EVs. And then what you do, you spin the cells down at a low gravity, 600 times, and you remove uh, apoptotic bodies in which you are not interested, 2,000 times G, and then finally, you spin at 100,000 times, it's a differential centrifugation. And the, the resulting uh, uh, EVs, uh, we characterize their size. Uh, on the top left, you see a, a red uh, a graph. This is by nanocyte, and it tells you that the uh, size distribution is really quite uh, precise, and it, it spans from 30 to uh, 100 uh, nanometers. And below that are electron micrographs of these EVs, and they, first of all, they show really healthy uh, EVs. But also, another uh, contribution of that is that they indicate also the same size range as uh, was found by this nanocyte uh, analysis. And on the uh, right, uh, you see the Western analysis of these uh, EVs, and uh, they show that they are positive of proteins that are characteristic of EVs, and their presence identifies them as bona fide EVs. So these are proteins like CD63, CD81, and NFDA8. So nice uh, EVs. So now we want to target them to the cancer, HER2 breast cancer, and we use the same approach that was used by the makers of trastuzumab. We decided to hook on to these EVs uh, ligands that would have specificity for targeting the HER2 receptor. And for that, we made a, uh, a novel chimeric protein. Uh, you know, the text 
in this uh, slide uh, tells you how these uh, how this protein was made. It was all very conventional uh, techniques, so I'm not going to uh, go into the nitty gritty of it. But let's concentrate on this uh, 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 protein structure itself: the uh, the yellow, red, green, and blue. The the uh, red part represents C1, C2 domains of lactadurin protein, which is milk fat protein. And they have the characteristic of latching on to the surface of the, uh, of the EVs. In front of that, we cloned um, an SCFD with a very high affinity for an anti-HER2 SCFD with very high affinity for the HER2 receptor. We also have the, there is the green one, and then the blue uh, shows you the beta sequence, and this permits the migration of this protein to the surface of the uh, of the EVs, and the yellow is histag for the purification of this protein, and then you see the uh, the uh, uh, western is a 68 kDA protein, and we show that it can only be it is only made by uh, cells that have been transfected with a plasmid that encodes this protein. And there is, uh, to the extreme left, below left, is the uh, predicted structure of this protein. The yellow part is the SCFV antibody, and the blue legs there are C1, C2. So they then hatch on to the surface of the uh, exosomes, exhibiting this SCFV antibody right on the top. So I will skip this slide. Okay. All right. So. What then we did, of course, is to uh, <clears throat> uh, infect or transfect HEC293 cells with the plasmid that could encode this protein and obtain EVs from them. And if, if it all worked out as we hoped it would, then these EVs would exhibit on their surface this uh, anti-HER2 uh, ligand, the anti-HER2 SCFV. And as you can see, if you look at the blue arrow on the, uh, no, the blue arrow, there's only one blue arrow. Uh, there is a schematic uh, representation of uh, a yellow EV. The EV is represented in yellow. And it has uh, uh, blue knobs, uh, sorry, green knobs on top. This represents the SCFV antibody, and, uh, or SCFV, yes, which is an antibody. And the red part, are the uh, C1, C2 uh, domains. Okay, so, you know, we made this in this way, directly from transfection, but we also made it by purifying this protein. Remember, there was the uh, histag in there. And uh, uh, mixed, uh, naive EVs, EVs obtained from non-transfected cells, which is the illustration to the right uh, of, this, uh, of this chart. And uh, when we did that, we found that, you know, the resulting EVs had greater affinity for targeting uh, the HER2 receptor, uh, I guess because, uh, you know, there was a, a more saturation, the, the, uh, the coverage was um, more, more complete when this method was used. And if you look at uh, uh, the, the, the graph, the bar graph, it shows you that, uh, and we used uh, uh, ELISA, to do this, a very standard technique, that both the uh, uh, transfected EVs, and EVs obtained by transfection, which is the uh, uh, sort of uh, yellowish uh, uh, bar, uh, it can bind, uh, they can bind the uh, HER2 receptor, but the binding of the reconstituted uh, uh, EVs is much greater. That is the sort of uh, dark uh, brown bar. Okay, so they can bind the receptor, but what about the uh, BT474 cells, the uh, HER2 positive cells? Do they have a predilection to bind the, the cells that are exhibiting this, uh, uh, this receptor? Do they have a predilection for it, and can they avoid the HER2 negative cells? And the answer is yes, we did uh, first atometry. And you need to look only at the uh, bar graph to your right, and you can see that, uh, again, the, uh, 
the, the dog uh, uh, slide, the, the dog bar, um, dog brown bar, shows you the binding of the uh, uh, of the uh, directed EVs to her two positive cells, and the blue bar to the extreme left uh, is binding to her to, to essentially her two negative cells. MCF7 do not. Uh, express uh, the HER2 receptor, and you can see that it is not binding. And then we also showed that if you mix the two, the interference by the negative cells is not great. So they do bind. They are directed, and they bind specifically to HER2 positive cells. Okay, great. But then we have to use them to deliver our gene. And here we decided not to use DNA which is what has been used in these other. Uh, I told you that one reason that the, uh, the, the test had failed was that the amount of, uh, the, the gene expression was inadequate. And one reason for that is that DNA really is highly inefficient for uh, gene delivery purposes. If, you know, if you introduce it into a cell, in order to be converted into a protein, it has got to get into the nucleus, transcribed there, come out of it and then have been translated into the protein. This whole process is, is highly inefficient, particularly in tumor cells. So we said, okay, we dispense the use of DNA. We use directly messenger RNA. Messenger RNA that encodes our improved uh, enzyme. Okay, that's great. But, you know, EVs are small structures and our efforts and many other, the efforts made by many other people to uh, load the EVs with an exogenous mRNA, including our own mRNA, initially did not succeed. But we did succeed uh, in the end. And this was done in collaboration with uh, system biosciences by using their uh, export uh, plasmid. In this plasmid, we uh, cloned our uh, enzyme encoding the CHRR, the improved uh, CHRR enzyme gene. And also in front of this uh, gene, we ligated, we, we put in front of it a 25 uh, nucleotide sequence, which is called uh, the zip code. This sequence was delivered, you know, um, EVs obtained from EVs that are generated by all kinds of cells, they do contain mRNA of their own. I'm talking about the difficulty of putting exogenous mRNA. The endogenous ones uh, do get in. And so what people did was to sequence these uh, endogenous uh, mRNAs, and they found that many of them had this 25 uh, 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 nucleotide sequence, and they dubbed it uh, the zip code. And so we put two copies of the zip code in front of the, of the gene. And when we used this uh, uh, plasmid to transfect uh, HEC293 cells, they indeed made, made EVs that contained uh, HTHRR6 uh, mRNA, as we could determine by PCR. Okay, so now we have, if you look at the, uh, at the uh, diagram at the top of the right side, uh, you, you can see a yellow structure which, which represents the uh, EV containing mRNA, so it is loaded with mRNA. And then we mix this with uh, the EVHB protein, the protein, that, the chimeric protein that uh, you know, target would make them targeted. And so we obtained loaded and directed uh, EVs. And these we call exodeps. All right, so are these exodeps capable of rendering HER2 positive cells competent to activate the prodrug xenon. And, you know, testing this became very easy, again, because of the fluorescence of uh, MCHB. All we had to do is just add xenon and see if fluorescence is generated. And you can see in the lower, the, the uh, one margin, the, uh, mar whose margin is red, that indeed, uh, when you, you know, the uh, fluorescence is generated, when, uh, her two positive cells are exposed to these exodeps and are hit with uh, with uh, CNOM. Okay, so one question is, uh, is it really transcription? 
you know, it may be that some DNA got uh, into the cells as well. You know, so we found that this capability of the cells to activate CNOP was independent of actinomycin D, which means no transcription was required. So no DNA is involved. Uh, and also that it was eliminated by the protein inhibitors, inhibitor cyclohexamine, which means that, that uh, translation was required. So it firmed up the fact that it is indeed mRNA that we have succeeded in putting into the uh, HER2 positive cells, which then generate the enzyme and acquire the capability of uh, activating the protra. Good. So this is all in vitro. How about the crux of the matter? How do these exotets and CNOV uh, act in a in vivo situation? So, you know, we did the uh, usual uh, things, a uh, statistically significant number of mice. We implanted in these mice human HER2 positive uh, tumors. And this was done orthotopically, meaning right on the breast. And we treated them with these uh, exodeps plus CNO. And I think all you need to do is look at this, uh, the blue curve, or, or, you know, the, on your left, uh, there is a graph. And the blue curve at the very bottom shows you, so, you know, the, the tumors had grown there and we started treatment. The tumors had attain, attained uh, 180 millimeter cube size. And when the complete treatment was given, you can see that there was near complete arrest of the growth of the tumor. So it's, you know, really highly gratifying result. And all the uh, controls, which are shown by other graphs there, uh, went on to develop uh, the tumor. So this was, uh, you know, a real success. And on the uh, right side, uh, by another uh, graph, you are seeing the tumor growth rate, which essentially gives the same results. Okay, so this is all of this is done in uh, immune compromised mice, but we think that in a immune competent situation, that the uh, uh, therapy can even be more uh, effective. And the reason is that, you know, when when the tumor is ablated inside the mouse, in the case of human beings, in the case also with them the HER2 protein is released and it would activate the immune response. And it has been shown that it does uh, optimize, you know, it does activate T and B cell responses. And in fact, uh, and by the way, this work is being done in collaboration with our uh, people, with our uh, fellow scientists at Duke University, Dr. Kim Lyonley and his group. So the fact that the HER2 receptor protein can uh, uh, evince a protective response against the HER2 positive tumor is shown in these uh, in these uh, graphs. If you look at the uh, the left one, uh, what it is showing is the uh, is the activation of the immune response. You know, you do it by ellipsoid and things like that. You you do major cytokines uh, production and such. And you can see that in all the controls, which are to your, uh, uh, to your left, uh, there is no uh, immune response. But when the vaccination is done, or the yeah, vaccination is done with uh, the HER2, uh, HER2 peptide, there is a marked uh, immune response. And this is further shown by the fact that in this mouse model that they have, which is really a very nice mouse model, and I will to give you a little bit more detail uh, of this. Uh, these mice spontaneously develop a positive tumor. But if you vaccinate them against uh, HER2, uh, you know, in the early stages of, of breast cancer, then you can utterly cure them from the development of, uh, uh, of tumors. Whereas in the uh, uh, that is shown by the by the green and red uh, line on the uh, graph to your to your right. In the controls, uh, the tumors develop uh, uh, you know, in, in the sort of way that you would expect when there is no immunity uh, against them. 
So let me now tell you a little bit about this mouse model. It has a, a, a uh, mutation in the HER2 gene called HER, HER2 delta 16. And it is, and this gene can be, its induction can be controlled. You can induce it whenever you want. Um, and what happens is that upon induction, these mice develop uh, HER2 positive tumors uh, very rapidly. So what we are doing now is testing our therapeutic regimen in this uh, in this setting. Uh, as I just showed you, um, with the vaccination, the mice, even after induction, did not develop uh, the, uh, the tumors. But this is useful, this is effective only if the treatment is done in early stages or before the, uh, the, the uh, tumor or the cancer develops. Once it is developed, this therapy alone is not enough. And that is why a combination of this approach, the immunological uh, uh, effect is, plus our therapy, we think can be uh, uh, quite helpful. Okay. Um, the other thing which is very uh, useful and uh, impressive is the, is the fact that uh, EVs can cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, you're seeing here the blood brain barrier, uh, the red uh, are the, uh, the vasculature, and yellow are the EVs. And you can see that many of them have crossed it. A number of them, however, get stuck, which means that we do need to uh, improve their, their capability to cross the blood brain barrier. And as you know, uh, metastasis to the brain, especially in HER2 positive cancer and, and in many other cancers, is really the, uh, the main issue that results in, uh, in uh, morbidity, morbidity and mortality. And of course, many of the uh, brain diseases also overexpress uh, uh, receptors, and one could use this approach to, to do that. And this is illustrated here. So for instance, uh, you know, as you saw, we reconstituted our EVs by adding the, the purified uh, EVHB protein. But we can also, instead of having that anti-SCFV in front of the C1C2 domain, we can put other targeting uh, uh, ligands. And some of them are uh, mentioned to the, on the left of your slide. And they have the capability of promoting transfer of EVs across the blood brain barrier. So this is something we are working on and we hope to be able to succeed. Now, our, in our recent work, we have uh, improved the prospects of uh, translation of this approach uh, to the clinic. Instead of plasmids, we have now used in vitro synthesized mRNA. The reason is that plasmids, you know, can introduce all kinds of nasty things into the EVs and who knows what that, that might do in the patient. Um, and we also found that when we did that, the EVs contain much more mRNA than uh, was the case with the plasmid uh, method. Um, and also, we have used CB1954, Tredozica, that I have mentioned to you before. And the reason is that, as you saw, it has been tested in clinical trials, and, and as a result, a safe human dose in this has been established. This is not the case with CNOP. And since our enzyme, ACHRR6, is equally good at uh, activating Tretazica or CD1954, uh, we decided to, to do this. And as a result, we have successfully uh, been able to use these IVT mRNA exodep, that is exodeps that contain that contain mRNA synthesized in vitro, uh, plus uh, CB1954. And this was achieved at 224 less uh, number of uh, EVs than was the case uh, with the uh, plasmid uh, uh, EVs. And uh, again, we found you know complete arrest of the tumor growth. I'm not presenting those data because this is a paper that we have just uh, submitted. And uh, you know they would be copyright right issues and such. And in collaboration with uh, Stanford and excellent Stanford scientists, we are now preparing, doing the work for IND enabling non-clinical pharmacological, pharmacodynamic, and toxicological studies, which then we hope will lead to first in human phase one 
chemical trial. This is the last slide, and that's, that's where I am. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Mann, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April of 2019. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon.